If you look at advertisements in the way that, say, an anthropologist might, you learn a lot about defilement. Because that's what advertisements are for, to take advantage of your, of your defilements. And they illustrate a lot of the principles that the Buddha taught about defilement. The very first one is that it's very easy to be defiled when you're distracted. Apparently there's a book that just came out talking about how it's been a conscious policy among advertisers to keep you as distracted as possible, to throw too much information at you, too many things for you to take in to shorten your attention span. And as your attention span gets shorter, you can't think straight. And when you don't think straight, you buy their stuff. Of course, the same principle applies to your greed, aversion, and delusion. They try to distract you. And because you're distracted, you give in to things. You don't think things all the way through, and you don't notice what's actually going on in the mind. Your attention is diverted someplace else. So you can think of meditation as kind of a defiant political act. You're here trying to extend your attention span. So you can see things all the way through. When something arises in the mind, where does it come from? Where does it go? The present moment isn't just an isolated dimension that has no reference to the past or the future. It comes from someplace and it's going someplace. And you want to see that. That's why we have mindfulness as the precursor to concentration. You want to keep something in mind. In this case, you want to keep in mind the fact that you want to stay with the breath and all the other lessons you've learned about staying with the breath, either through what you've heard or read, or what you've observed on your own as you've meditated before. Think of those things as being at your fingertips. You don't have to sit around and memorize them all the time or run through them run them through your memory, but try to be aware that when a problem comes up, see if you can ask yourself, you know, what was the way I dealt with that problem in the past? Where is this problem coming from right now? That's what alertness is for, is to see where things are happening. And of course, ardency is your desire to shape things in a good shape. The mind is out of shape. What do you do to bring it back into shape? If the breath feels distorted, what do you do to normalize it? If your breathing feels constricted, what can you do to expand your rib cage, expand all the way down? So the entire area of your lungs gets used. So you feel more and more refreshed by the breath. And then see what happens as a result. You want to see cause and effect. I mean, this is the Buddha's first teaching to Rahula. When you act, remember, your actions are going to have consequences, so you want to anticipate them. And then notice, okay, when you actually act, what are the results? And then if they're not what you like, go back and make some changes. This is a principle you can apply from your outside actions all the way into your inside actions particularly with your meditation. This is how meditation becomes a skill. You see things through consistently. And then as your attention span gets stronger like this, and you're able to observe for longer periods of time, see the connections. It's a lot harder for your defilements to come in and sneak in and whisper a little something in your ear and then run away, and then whisper a little more and then run away. You see them coming, you see them going. And you begin to see the processes by which the mind decides to take them in or to reject them. And you get more in control. So that's one of the principles you learn, is that the less distracted you are, the more you can see, and the more clearly you can think things through. The other principle, of course, is that when they present an object to sell to you. It's not just the object. They try to create all kinds of connotations around it. Remember years back they were selling the Ford experience? It's almost as if they weren't selling Fords. The experience of owning a Ford. They tried to make it attractive. Well, BMW was doing a better job. They had that really obnoxious commercial where this guy comes out to an Rooftop parking lot, and there's his BMW parked over there, and it's just glowing 
like no other car in the parking lot, and he shivers. And that's the BMW shiver. And that's what they were selling. So that's what your mind does to you, too. As the Buddha said, it's not so much sensual objects that we get carried away with. It's the fantasies we have around them. You can fantasize all kinds of things about almost any kind of object. Because some objects are more conducive than others, but it's the, the fantasy around them. And you want to see, why are you indulging this? Because this, as the Buddha said, this is what sensuality is all about. It's not so much the objects or the pleasures. It's our plans and fantasies about them. And we're hooked on that. So we have to figure out how do we unhook ourselves. And first, of course, to see the drawbacks of the object. This is one of the reasons, say, if you're attracted to another person, that contemplation of the body is a good one. But that doesn't do the whole job. It helps to poison the fantasy. But it may turn out that that's not what the fantasy was about for, and may not be what the allure is all about. The image of you or the things that you got to do, your sense of who you are in the fantasy. That may be part of it. But a good way of testing what the real allure is is that principle of poisoning the fantasy. Just as something seems to be getting good in the fantasy, try to put something bad in. Think of a John Lee's story about the time when he was fantasizing about disrobing and getting married. He was able to get a job, and he was able to get a, the daughter of a nobleman as his wife. And what did he want to do? He wanted to take her back home and show her off to his friends. He said that's, he said that's when his fantasies started to take on some class. So it had very little to do with her. And a lot of it had to do with what, how he looked in the, the eyes of his family and friends. But then he started poisoning the fantasy. After all, she was the daughter of a nobleman. She couldn't work hard, and she had died in childbirth, or soon afterwards. So there he was, stuck with a the child they'd have to raise without a wife to do it. And then things just got worse and worse and worse, until he finally got to the point where he realized, boy, I wish I hadn't disrobed. And then he realized, because I haven't disrobed, here I am, I'm still a monk. That's one way, just let the fantasy get really bad. But then you find part of the mind resists that, and you learn some really interesting things about the mind. One thing I've noticed is this kind of a magical principle of magical thinking that goes on. You think that if you can fantasize about something, it's going to happen. And that's absolutely crazy. We're not living in the world of Barney the Dinosaur, where everything you imagine can happen. But the mind does think in that way. So when you unearth that, if that's what the problem is, it weakens the tendency to want to keep going back, because you realize you're not gaining anything. You're not establishing the fact that this will be the future. Or if it is the future, you've got to watch out. Remember that old principle, you know, be aware of what you wish for, because you may get it. Our fantasies, our ideas, they lead to a lot of unintended consequences. So be careful. Because it does bend the mind, as the Buddha says. You think about sensuality, the mind gets bent in that direction. And it's not the kind of mind you want to have bent. It gets bent by ill will, it gets bent by greed, aversion, and delusion. These things can make you do really stupid things. Of course, a lot of the fantasy the appeals of a different kind of fantasies, so the fantasy of being someone who loves someone else or being loved by someone else. A lot of it has to do with simply the fact that you're lacking a sense of well-being in the present moment. And this, as the Buddha said, is one of the functions of doing concentration practice, is you get a sense of well-being here. If your meditation doesn't give you that sense of just feeling viscerally really good sitting here, then it's not going to be able to, all, to do all the things that meditation should. So work on getting a sense of real comfort right here. 
This too can be your protection against the parts of the mind that like to do weird fantasies that pull you away. Another way of poisoning the fantasy, of course, is that contemplation the Buddha has. He says, you know, there are people in the world who can read minds. Suppose they're reading your mind right now. What would they think? Now, there are teachings where the Buddha says, you know, don't be concerned about other people's opinions. Don't be worried by their criticism or praise. But he also says, take into consideration the counsel of the wise, what their opinion would be on things. And this too, you know, it, it, it basically comes down to a sense of honor, the kind of honor that is coupled with a healthy sense of shame. You'd be ashamed to do things that are beneath you. After all, we're trying to work on the precepts that are pleasing to the noble ones, so that they could see our behavior, they would be pleased. One of the contemplations the Buddha has the monks engage in every day is, can I criticize myself with regard to my precepts? Could those who know criticize me with regard to my precepts? Because there's part of our mind that thinks it's living in the eyesight of somebody. So make it the noble ones whose eyesight you're in. A sense of honor really depends on who you want to look good to. There's a lot of stupid things people do with their sense of honor, but there can be a lot of noble things that their sense of honor makes them do, but ultimately on whose eyes they want to look good in. So choose very discerning eyes, the eyes of the noble ones. As your standard. So remember, it's the tricks of the defilements. This is how the advertising agents, agencies make their living, is by figuring out people's defilements. Years back, I remember reading a profile of one of the students in the alumni magazine, the college I went to. He was talking about him. He's Planning to do something really original. He was using. He was going to use his degree in psychology and go into advertising. And I said, "That's not original at all. They've been doing that all along." What you want to do is take your knowledge of psychology and use it for the sake of freeing yourself from the defilements. As that chant said just now, we're slaves to craving. We think the craving is our friend, but they're ordering us around. Think of those images that John Mahabu and John. Man used and John Mahabua says, you know, our defilements get up on top of our heads and then they go use our brains and use our minds our minds as their bathroom. Or as John Mun said, the defilements have been laughing at us for a long time. They get us to do what they want and then they run away and we're the ones left holding the bag. So use these other ways of thinking to poison the fantasy. The calling to question that magical thinking that if you can imagine it, it's going to become a true pleasure. But this requires, of course, that the mind can get settled down and have a sense of belonging right here and having some nourishment right here. So look at your breath right now. Does it feel as nourishing as it could be? What could be more nourishing than it is right now? Where is there tension? Where is there tightness in the body that's constricting things? Can you think of that opening up? So you're breathing all the way down to the soles of your feet. And everything inside is getting nourished. Because that puts you in a really good position, it gives you a good perspective, so that when other potential pleasures come up, you've got this. And you will learn to get quick at this as well, because there are times when greed, aversion, and delusion come in when you're feeling weak and tired. And you want something right away to learn how to tap into this right away. One good exercise I found is as you go through the day, just stop every now and say, tell yourself, okay, I've got five minutes to settle down. and stick with it as consistently and as rigorously as you can. Try to find, figure out where is your spot in the body. 
that feels really good as you breathe in, really good as you breathe out. Go right there. Get quick about this. And that gives you one more tool or one more weapon in your arsenal. Because that's another one of the tricks of the advertisers. They, they want to force you to make a quick decision. So again, as your act of defiance, be quick in getting the mind still. And see if you can keep it still for long periods of time. Because that's an act not only of defiance, but it's also a path to freedom. <laughs>